I can suggest it. <clears throat> but I cannot pretend to have the right to tell them what to do because I'm on the outside and I'm not going to be in that protest. And unless I'm there with them, I can't ask them to do it. And that also becomes tricky at times because sometimes I feel like, oh, there should be a protest at this time in this place because that could make a huge difference. But unless I can be there myself, um, I can't call for it. Um, another difficulty is you always end up blaming yourself. You always end up feeling guilty. When, uh, when I read details about how my father had been uh, beaten unconscious in front of my family and taken away, I felt like I had failed my family for not being there and for not protecting them. And it's very difficult to find strength at those moments, not to book a ticket and just fly right back. Um, but, it, but my father told me something very important when I left the country. He told me it's important to be part of the movement and it's important to be part of the protest. But it's also important to make sure that these protesters are not forgotten. And it's also important to make sure that these protesters are not silenced. And he said, as long as you can play that role, you need to keep playing it. As long as you can make sure that internationally, the people of Bahrain are not forgotten and not silenced, then you need to do that. You have a responsibility to do that. And I think that that's what stops me from going back to Bahrain, nothing else. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan Gaines, and I have congratulations on your prize. Uh, my question is about some very recent events in Bahrain. Uh, as you well know, over half the population in Bahrain is, are not citizens, they are foreign guest workers uh, from Pakistan, from India, from Bangladesh, and there have been growing reports of violence against them, which the regime has been able to use as an opportunity to portray the opposition movement as engaging in unprovoked violence, uh, including bombing attacks and so on. So I was wondering if you could comment on uh, how the presence of foreign workers complicates the situation and whether you're worried that the opposition movement is being captured or in danger of being captured by uh, xenophobic elements. Migrant workers in Bahrain make up 51% of the population. Um, and they live in the most miserable conditions that you can imagine. They, um, they live in overcrowded homes that are not suitable for even a few people to live in. They're underpaid and overworked. And it's basically what we call modern day slavery. Their, their passports are taken away uh, and they don't have the freedoms that they should have. Um, the situation in Bahrain is that it's, it's a very complicated situation when it comes to the migrant workers and I would need to go into all these different details which are more. But I'll try to explain it in as short time as possible. You have a situation where the royal family in Bahrain runs the entire country like it's a family business. And part of that is making as much money as possible. And so what they do is they bring migrant workers from southeastern southeastern Asian countries, and uh, they, like I said, as modern day slaves, because they can pay them less and not give them as many benefits as they would have to with Bahrainis. And so we have an entire number of Bahrainis who are unemployed because these migrant workers are brought into the country. Um, have there been attacks on migrant workers? There probably have been. And we condemn that to the utmost. It is not okay in any circumstance or any situation to attack another human being. It's, it's just not. Um, one of the complications that we did face in Bahrain is that the security forces in Bahrain, more than 90% are made up of non-Bahrainis. The Bahraini regime has been practicing political naturalization for the past approximately 15 years. They've been bringing in tens of thousands of people from Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, Jordan, uh, and putting them in the security forces of the army and giving them Bahraini citizenship, and then using them against the people. And part of what they did last year is they would send out uh, people of Pakistani origin in plain clothes to attack protesters. And at that point, it did to some extent become difficult for protesters to separate between police officers and uh, or people working for the security forces and migrant workers who are working in uh, regular stores. Again, that doesn't excuse it. But to what extent are there attacks on migrant workers? I don't think it's to the extent that the Bahraini government makes it appear to be. The Bahraini people have been living with migrant workers for such a long time. And the Bahraini people are some of the kindest people I've ever met. Um, you know, in Ramadan, families go out and give when the migrant workers are working through sunset, the Bahraini families will go and bring them food so that they can eat. Um, 
like I said, I'm not saying that there aren't attacks, but I don't think it's to the extent that the Bahraini regime makes it appear. About the bombings, the Bahraini government has yet to present evidence that those bombings actually took place. Um, as human rights defenders, we've constantly and again and again asked for independent investigations. These migrant workers who were killed, they have a right, and their families have a right to know what happened. Nobody believes what the Bahraini regime says. They've been lying about so many things and fabricating so many different cases that we just don't believe their statements anymore. And we believe that there should be an independent investigation about what happened, and the people who are responsible for killing them should be held accountable in a fair and independent trial, not tortured and not given a death sentence without a real trial. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Hennigman. I'm the founder of uh, Lomini.com. And I work along with bloggers and Christian journalists in the region. Um, I want to go back to definitions because there's always you know, controversy around should we call this um, an Arab uprising, the Arab Spring. Um, and you know, some of the will even say that, I mean, you mentioned revolution, some will say that. There's not a revolution that we need to change. Um, I mean, Yemen would be a good example. Um, we still have Saudi people very much in our presence. Um, and that's the case, obviously, in other countries as well. Um, you said the uprising in the 50s, you called this, that's always different, but you call this a revolution, which is different to questions. Why is this a revolution? What happens if you don't see it? What change? And uh, what's the end goal? Is it just to get human rights and justice, or do you want to see a political, you know, Older terms, we are, you know, front uh, uh, overthrow of the, of the of the government itself. You know, I think at this point of the revolutions, we don't pay too much attention to the labels um, or what they really mean. Um, I think for a lot of people in Bahrain, the last thing they care about is what the term revolution means as a definition. The term revolution to the people means them coming out to the streets and demanding change. For them, that's what revolution means, and that's why they call it a revolution. Um, of course, if we're going to discuss this from a more um, definitive way of you know, people who have actually studied the term and what revolution means, I wouldn't be the person to do it because I haven't studied it. Um, but I think that the, the reason why people believe that this is a revolution and not an uprising is because they believe that change has to come and it will come at some point. As human rights defenders, we don't call for a, polit a, a certain political system. So as a human rights defender, I don't call for a constitutional monarchy or a republic or a democracy. What I do call for is a government that respects human rights, regardless of what, which system it is. What I do call for is accountability. I believe that the king, the crown prince, and the prime minister of Bahrain need to be put on trial, a fair and independent trial according to international standards, and then to be held accountable. And if that means sending them to prison, then so be it. They have to be sent to prison. And so I think that there's a, there's a difference. But the population of Bahrain is demanding something very simple, the right to self-determination, the right for them to decide who they should be governed by and how. And so there are two different uh, ways of looking at the situation. We're running out of time, so unfortunately. But we, you will have time to make yeah. well and, and uh, talk to Mayan afterwards after the session is over uh, and ask lots of questions. But I do have the right to ask one question. Uh, that's my publicity here. Uh, I, I follow you on Twitter. And uh, I, uh, the day before you arrived here in Stockholm, you wrote uh, a tweet, uh, a message on Twitter uh, saying, when you defend people's rights, even if you disagree with their opinions, that's being just. It's not weakness, but strength not naivety, but understanding. That made me think, who did you write that tweet to? Was it to yourself? Um, that actually was exactly about the Kuwait protests. Um, I was under a lot of attack that, that day uh, for the statements that I had made supporting the protests in Kuwait. And what I tend to do is because I don't have time to respond to every single person because there's so many different people talking to me. And so what I tend to do is I tend to see what they're saying and then respond to them with one general statement. And I felt that that more or less covered it all because people were saying things to me like, oh, you're so weak, 
you're, uh, you know, you don't, you're so naive to think that, you know, supporting human rights is just an issue, things like that. And I felt like I needed to shift that theory, that, you know, supporting people despite disagreeing with them is weakness or naivety. It's actually understanding, and it's actually strength. And that's, that's my belief about nonviolence as well. And, you know, a lot of people think that it's strength to fight back, to pick up a gun. And albeit that I understand why some people do that, it makes complete sense in some situations. I would never support it, but I understand why people sometimes have to. But I also think that there's so much strength and courage in nonviolence because the whole idea of nonviolence is that when I'm being beaten by a police officer, he wants me to react in a certain way. He wants me to hit him back. And when I choose to not do that, when I choose to sit there and receive his beatings, but not respond in the same way, I am actually regaining control of my situation. I am reaffirming that I decide what my response should be. And so I take away the control that he thinks he has over me. And that's why I believe that nonviolence is very powerful. It's not weakness, it's actually strength. Thank you. I think uh, I speak on behalf of everyone, uh, uh, the, uh, the Larsons, uh, the jury expo, the organizers, that I say that you, thank you for the work that you do, man. You are a true inspiration to all of us. And there's something we don't know about you, uh, and that's that besides being a human rights defender, an activist, uh, a very inspiring person, uh, you're also a poet. And we didn't know that. Uh, and you have been uh, published in Politiken. So since we have a little bit time left for the next part of this event, um, you, we would like you to recite uh, one of your poems, which is called Live Interview. And I'm going to leave the stage, and I would like you to, to read it, uh, standing up, if that's okay for you. Thank you. How does it feel? I'm okay, but he's your father. How does it feel? You look at me, searching for tears. I look you in the eyes and I respond. I cannot answer your question. Your camera will malfunction. Your mic will lose sound. How does it feel? I feel cheated. Cheated of a dream of freedom. Cheated. Former chief of secret service running for president in Egypt. Cheated. Protesters beaten on the streets after a new government in Tunisia. Cheated. One man election, former man's government in Yemen. Cheated. Friends making empty promises of savior in Syria. Cheated. Petrol more valuable than blood in Bahrain. Drown out their screams with the roar of an engine. We're trying to help you. We'll send 30 people as intervention. Silence. Babies crying. Mothers weeping. Sirens blaring. Wives in mourning. Silence. Was that the sound of pellets entering a Bahraini's heart? Or a sniper's bullet aimed at a Syrian's head? Silence. Are those the children of Gaza looking at the sky, waiting for the bombs? I hear nothing but silence, alone in a room thousands of miles away. I missed you by a minute, Dad. I called, but the officer had cut the line. It might have been the first time, it would have been the first time I talked to you in months. It might have been the last time I hear your voice. You want to know how I feel? I feel angry. Angry at governments that preach freedom and democracy, then support authoritarian regimes to feed their greed. Angry at governments who say they condemn violations, but refuse to do anything to stop them from happening. And no, you will not see me cry for my father. A man who fears not death, because in death he finds freedom. A man who fears not tyranny, because they can break his body, but not his soul. I cry not for my father, for he puts a smile on my face. The tears you see in my eyes are for you. Sorry, ma'am. We lost the connection. Thank you.